Good evening again, everyone. My name is Ada Campbell. I'm the organizer of tonight's event. Thank you all for coming. As I mentioned, I did not want to hold your patience, but we are here for a very important reason. We have the candidates here for the Board of Education, um, the, yeah, the Board of Education. Uh, the election is next Tuesday. Please go out and vote, spread the word. This is a very, very important time in our history, in our community. How we're going to do this, we're going to have each person give an introduction, tell us a little bit about themselves. We're going to go through a series of questions, and then at the end, we'll have an opportunity for everyone to give their own, ask their own questions, and for the candidates to answer them. As you will see, everyone has a name tag in front of their uh, position, so please, if you can't, if you can't see it, you're welcome to move into the middle. And we're going to start with Mr. Eric Motley with introductions. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Eric Motley. Which is a part of the Department of 
health and human services, um, and it is inspired by uh, President Obama's father, the responsible father of the Mentoring Initiative. Uh, in that capacity, I have um, traveled the country and seen many different types of school districts, many different types of situations uh, that I think that, that would lend itself well to this board. I have two children as well. One, Maya, is graduating from this year. She just got accepted to NYU. So I have to open up my checkbook. And my son Trey is a freshman in, at NFA as well. He's on the varsity tennis team. <coughs> Which one of us won last year? Um, and uh, we reside in the Barbara section of the Italian neighborhood. And I've been here since uh, 1998, I think it's been. My children have gone through the school system, the school district, um, since, us, since, since we arrived here back in 1998. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. First of all, I want to say thank you. I want to thank everybody for coming out to you take some time out of your day, out of your daily uh, chores to come here this evening to hear what we have to offer as candidates for the Newburgh and Lawrence City School District Board of Education. My name is Phil Powell. I am a lifelong resident of the city of Newburgh, born and raised, having matriculated through the Newburgh Lawrence City School District, school system, elementary, junior high and high school. Upon leaving Newburgh Free Academy, I attended school at Delphi University on Long Island. After leaving the Delphi, I came back to Newburgh because I wanted to be a part of something that I thought was great. Uh, I'm a Newburgh grad heart. I'm a goal back, as we like to say. If you're, if you're a Newburgh high school graduate, one of the most proud things to say as I travel throughout the state and throughout the country is that I'm from Newburgh, New York, and I am a gold bat. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm looking for myself as a candidate for the Newburgh Lawrence School District Board of Education because I truly and honestly feel as I travel the streets of Newburgh every day, I look out and I look into the kids' eyes. And a lot of them will never have that opportunity to say those words. And that is a travesty. And I'm offering myself as a candidate to this board to try to come on and bring solutions. So perhaps every child, not some children, not most children, but all children that come through our school system can one day proudly say, I am from Newburgh, New York, and I am a gold medal. Thank you. Why do you want to remain on the board 
And what good do you hope to accomplish for the district? We're going to start with Mr. Howard and go on down to Ms. Long. Well, <clears throat> one of the main reasons I would like to become a member of the Blue River Laurel City School District Board of Education is because of the passion that I have for the children in the city of Newburgh. Uh, it's very depressing as I, as I walk around the streets in, in the Newburgh and Larson School District area that encompasses, and I see a lot of our children not in school. Some of our children aren't reaching their full potential. And I truly feel that there's two sides of this problem. Can you do a part of the problem or you're part of the solution? I want to be a part of the solution. I want to offer what I have to this board to try to enhance some of the things for our children in this area. I.e., we have to address the job rate. We need to understand that all children do not learn the same. I mean, I see, as I look about in this area, I see a lot of children that are just put, being put to the wayside. It's not good. It's not a good thing because all children, and I keep emphasizing the word all, all children deserve a quality education. And I truly and honestly feel that right now, the city of Newburgh, town of Newburgh, town of Newburgh, which encompasses Newburgh North City School District, is not serving our students to its full potential. I think there's a lot of things that can be done. I know there are issues that are in place with regards to funding and things such as that, but at the end of the day, all the parents, all the adults that are in this system should have one agenda, and that is for all of our children to receive a quality education so that they can go out once they leave the University Academy and be competitive globally with the students that are going to be their peers when they either go to college or when they go to trade schools or when they go to the service or wherever they go from here, they need to be better prepared to enter that IE workforce or that school or curriculum. They need to understand that it's going to take some work on their behalf, but more importantly, it's going to take something on our behalf as students, I'm sorry, as parents, as stakeholders in this whole situation because at the end of the day, their future is our future. They are our future. So that's the reason why I really want to be a part of this board. Our situation, uh, 
they say the definition of insanity is to do the same thing over and over again and expect a different result. Well, I'm suggesting that I think if, if we continue to go the path that we're going, that's what's going to continue to happen. And the result is going to be disastrous for our children. So I'm offering myself as a board member because I believe that I can bring some new light, some new vision, some new um, resources actually to the table that will assist us in educating our children and being creative and innovative in, in that process. We can't do things the same way. We have to be able to understand the specific nature of the, uh, the things that face us in this community and deal with it accordingly. We have to be able to educate those kids where they are, given the situations that they come from, and understand them. So that's why I think I'm going to the table, because I've seen it, I've witnessed it, I've done it in other, in other states and other cities, and I want to bring all of that knowledge to bear here in our district. Very, very frustrating to sit there 
and you know, you absolutely want to do what's right, but you seem stifled at times. And I, I, I just don't know. I, 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 I find myself going home at night after a board meeting, and you know what, if you have to vote on things that you, know, you have to vote on, but if you do what's right for the district, what you think is right for the district. And sometimes, in your conscience, I mean, it happens. And, and fiduciary constraints, that, are, that is the biggest thing to tell you the truth. And we all feel, I've been a lifelong city resident, and you know what? We all, all feel it. And the district feels it. But you know what? As a board member for two and three quarter years, I, I really think that, you know what, we're trying to do the best we can. And, you know, I, I wish the other candidates, to tell you the truth, the, the best of luck. And if I do not win this election, to tell you the truth, um, all of you, to tell you the truth, will have a very, very, very daunting task ahead of you. And from what you two gentlemen and Miss Fesh said, and it's it's absolutely absolutely unbelievable what a board member has to deal with as a volunteer. And what I want for myself is, you know what? I want to give back to the community as a volunteer. You know what? At times I volunteer at the hospital, but I mean this is this is very good. I mean you know you're making a difference for the students. And I say the staff, because if it wasn't for the staff, I mean, you know what? I mean, what would we have? And you know what? I will leave you on that. And I, I certainly thank you for being audience members. And uh, that's all.
And, um, you know, I'm not saying I want to do anything, but I want to see what I can do to help and get more involved. And many times in the past, I've tried to do things, but being an outsider, you can't get involved unless it's your child. Um, and I want to get on the board so I can help make changes and also give our young children some of them. Also, to 
our audience, if you have a point or a thought or an idea that you want to, the candidates to address, jot it down. We'll have an opportunity to have questions answered at the end of this general question and answer period. All right, the question is, youth violence is a serious issue in our community and the students have been affected. As a member of the board, how would you address this particular issue in the schools and in the broader community? Well, I think I can address that. And, um, on Saturday, it, it is a start. We do have gang problems in Newburgh, I mean the city, but they are also branching out to our two towns of New Windsor and Newburgh. But uh, I think more forums have to be put on. Uh, as of 12.30 on Saturday, um, three doctors are making a presentation at the NFA auditorium. Um, should I say that there should be more education about gangs, uh, maybe in health classes, that they have to look at curriculum. Um, but gang violence is a very, very serious thing in the world. And what would I do to change it? To tell you the truth, um, police officers, police officers, most people in gangs are afraid of police officers. But you know what? I mean, the community resource officers in schools to discuss things like that. Absolutely. Who well, they are teachers in their own right. So I mean, is it is it a solution? No, there, there's not a solution. But I think it's a beginning. Thank you.
in the situation that we have in the New River Lawrence City School District. That is a situation that should not exist because social workers are the buffer between the teachers, the parents, and the students. You have some teachers, some parents, some administrators that cannot get through to the parents. We have a situation where we have kids coming to school and we think all kids are like us. We think every child, every morning, gets up from eight hours of sleep, have breakfast, put on clean clothes, go on to school, got pencils, have notebooks, and ready to learn. Unfortunately, that's not the case here. We have situations where if we're really paying attention to the children in our schools, we have some angry kids here. We have kids that don't eat breakfast in the morning. I'm going to ask every parent in here right now, if you go to your job in the morning and you don't eat, how productive are you at work? You're not too productive at all. So we need to address those issues, because those issues lead to the violence in our schools. We wonder why kids act out. There's a reason why kids act out. A lot of kids are crying out for help, and we're not identifying at, a, at an earlier stage. And if we continue to turn the eye, turn the other eye to the things that we're not addressing, the situation is going to get a whole lot worse. And we, as community stakeholders, we have a lot of investment there also, because that violence is happening in the school districts, it's happening in the school buildings, or going to spill over to your neighborhoods. It's going to spill over to the streets of the city of Newburgh. It's going to spill over to New Windsor. It's going to spill over to uh, the town of Newburgh. So we need to address the real issues here. The real issues are that we need to find out what's going on in our children's lives. We need to find out what's going on in our kids' lives. All kids do not come from the same background. And we need to understand it. And we need to start identifying it at an early enough stage in the development of kids so that we can address it and we can put things into place to make children who are coming from disadvantaged backgrounds give them the tools to be successful. Thank you. That's how the history that I was supported. Preston and I have always fought for exactly what you're saying. And that Dignity Act is in place. I'm on the policy, I'm chair of the policy, and that is in place. And before that was in place, we had already started doing that in the school district. We started back in character reference, character education when they were young. That started years ago. At NFA, we brought people like yourself in. We put uh, the officers in place. They wore street clothes, they were out on the streets. We have, I can speak for myself and Princeton, that we have always supported and we do, always supported every child, inner city, the towns, everybody. And we have tried to introduce programs, we've reached out to teachers of the African American and have not been able to pull anybody in. Grace Bowles was on that committee, the diversity committee, trying to pull in teachers. Um, we've been doing parent reach out, Pam Buxton Peterson now. Pam Peterson is, is amazing at it. She puts programs together and she gets the kids out. We don't always get as many parents as we like, but she is constantly trying. She is constantly trying. The board is always reaching out to the civic groups. It's not like it's not, it's being ignored. It is not being ignored. It is not being ignored. It's, it's, our, there's just not enough people to reach out to these kids. And we all want to do that. And as far as the social workers go, none of us wanted to cut anybody. But we were trying to be fair and balanced across the board. We have other social workers coming in. And if you look at some of those social workers' records and their attendance, it isn't really all that everyone thinks it is. They're not, some are exceptional, but there's the exception. And we're trying to, we already have in place the other social workers to come in. I'm praying that they do what they can do. They may not be as good. We don't, maybe they'll be better. Maybe they'll be just as good, if not better. Maybe they'll take these kids just like we do. As far as breakfast and meals go, every school serves lunch to every child who needs it every day, whether they pay or not. And that is a given. Every teacher has the opportunity to take care of their children. This district wants to do the right thing by all kids, not just some kids, by all kids. Thank you.
like to uh, uh, jump into the conversation as well. Um, I'm, I'm going to uh, take Phil's point and kind of come at it from a different direction. Uh, I think the issue is not about anger or violence, it's about pain. And I think what happens is, is that kids are in pain. And when kids are in pain, those, that's a symptom of a greater issue. And because of the work that I do on a daily basis over the last 10 years, working with fathers and fathers that are not connected to their children, I recognize, and I'll just give you a few statistics. In 1963, the Moynihan Report came out. And in that report, it was cited that 23% of the families were without a father in the home, so they were raised by single mothers. And, and in the report, the term that was used was that it was a disastrous statistic. The statistic today is 75% of children are living without their biological father. And so when we look at the dynamics that Phil talked about, and we see that kids may be coming from an environment where they're not even referenced, they're coming from an environment where mom has to work extra hours and, and two jobs. When dad's not there, they're coming from an environment where they're actually becoming a father or a father figure for the younger siblings at a, at a younger age. These are all pressures that create pain, and pain turns into anger. And then when we, when we see these kids, we have to understand that they're kids. And this pain that they're going through, they can't process it. So I appreciate that we have tried things as a district. But I've also seen successes. And I've also seen how districts have partnered with community-based organizations. I've also seen how districts have applied and received funding from OJGDP and from other sources, the Department of Labor. I've also seen how districts have done things like alternate, alternate, ed alternate education through community colleges and other uh, types of alternate education opportunities. So, is again going back to that old, old concept is that we can't keep looking at the same thing, trying to solve it the same way, and get upset that we can't find results. We have to be innovative and creative in our approaches. We have to look throughout this, this country, this vast country of ours, and see what's working and employ it. We need every demographic as far as eligibility for funding is concerned. I see the funding come across my desk every day. And I don't know how many acts, uh, how access, how much grant funding that we access as a district. I look for that. And that's what we need to do more. But I think we have to step back from this approach that we are trying to say, trying that. These kids are in pain. And when you have kids in pain, you have to rescue them. There's a, there's a theory in law called negligence. And when you have Negligence is when there's a duty of care that you owe to a child or to someone that you're responsible for, and a breach of that duty of care, and, and there's a causation and there's damages. But we are in breach of our civic responsibility to these children because they're in pain and we have not come to rescue them. We have to be creative in our rescue attempts and we have to be innovative in our rescue attempts. And there's no reason why we can't accomplish what's been accomplished all over the country in school districts. And so the youth violence issue is a serious issue, but the youth pain issue is the real issue. We have to deal with pain. We have to deal with, and, and see, the social worker thing is bigger than just uh, them making sure that they come to school on time. The social worker thing and community-based organization thing is about how we deal with real problems in people's real lives. Because I can't be educated if I can't become hungry. I can't be educated if I just have to dodge a bullet. I can't be educated if I had to take, I didn't get any sleep last night because I had to take care of my little brother and sister. I can't be educated. So we do have to look into those things. And we do have to find a way we can resolutions. And those are in community-based organizations, those are in finding funding sources, and those are in creatively doing uh, alternate, creatively looking at alternate educational opportunities. Because all of our students aren't, aren't going to go to college. But that doesn't mean that they can't be educated. And that can't that doesn't mean that they can't be given a, 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 a skill that's going to provide for them and their families. 
So I think as, as far as I'm concerned, the way we address, uh, as a board member, the way we have to address this issue of youth violence is to address this issue of pain. Thank you. I wrote a lot of notes down, and it seemed like uh, Mr. Howard you know, my notes. But nevertheless, um, I feel also, and I want to tap into the social work, I feel that as a district, we let them go is a tragedy. Not only that, but next year we won't have security guards at the elementary school, and at the elementary school. And that's nonsense. Because some of our schools open early, and how for our district not to keep security guards in our elementary school and put our kids at a safety risk is very, very disturbing to me. And I still don't understand how they came about that. But nevertheless, again, I like the other two young men, brother, who said, I'm really concerned about the social workers and our social kids. And not only that, I really, in the past, I heard one of the, I was talking to one of the performance superintendent. She says, we didn't have a game problem. And when she said that, that blew my mind. That let me know that the board really don't understand our district and our city for her to say that. But I don't believe they really understand the city and our kids. So with me coming onto the board, I believe I can help enlighten. And it's not really one solution. I think we all can come together as one and bring a solution and help put this, help put it together and help our kids. Thank you. 
violence going on or being part of violence. As a mom, that's what I would do. If something wrong with my child, I go to the child and I ask, what's the problem? Talk to me. This is what I do as part of this community. I can walk up and down the streets without being afraid because I am a part of this community, because I was raised in this community, because I am this community. It's very easy for an outsider to look in and say, this is what you have to do, this is what needs to be done. But they're not living in here. They don't know what we go through every single day. They don't know, know our situation as single moms, as um, a married couple, as a single father, as a child, living in this community, living in this, in this, in this district, especially in, in, in the city of New York. And outside of it, it's just to say, this is what you need to do. Of course, the police here has to do with it every single day on a daily basis. They write very minute by minute. So go to the source, go to the children, go to the kids, go to the adults, the parents, the families, and ask them, how can I help? What is the problem? Talk to me. And together, as a community, as a district, if we come together, we can overcome it. We just have to find ways to do it, but together, we can do that. Not just looking at it and saying, this is the problem, this is how you do it. No. Go to the stores, come up, talk to the kids, walk the streets, and find out what really is going on in this world. Thank you. I'm anxious to hear what the audience has to say. So I'm only going to ask about maybe one or two more questions of the whole board, and then we'll get into some more specifics. Before I go on to my next question, um, Ms. Resch has a Yeah, this is a big concern 
Southern Illinois. Um, this past year, um, my daughter was going from sixth to seventh grade, and um, you know, one of the things that I really wanted for her was to be in the honors program, and um, they told me she couldn't. I had to spend three days down at the board arguing with her, presenting her um, her work that she had done at, from the third grade on. I say contest she had win, win in one state um, competition, spelling bee. Um, and finally, they decided to, okay, you see you're not going away, we're going to let her in. Um, you know, she's maintaining a 95 average in English right now. Um, on the other hand, math, they said that she was doing great and that she was in honors in math and they would allow her, just to give me a lead, to be in math honors. I said I wouldn't accept it unless she's in honors for everything. Um, math, unfortunately, she had a tutor going to the house every week and I had to pay fifty dollars an hour um, to tutor her. Um, you know, so it's just like you know, you say, you know, I have to agree with you in terms of you can't teach to a state test sometimes uh, for your classwork in particular. No, for most students, no, but for many of our kids, um, you do have to teach toward the state test because that test is evaluating them. Such as the SAT, PSAT. Um, one of the other things I would love to do is uh, make the PSAT free. We're in a low income area here, and um, even though I'm not trying to cause the budget to go up anymore, um, if you go around the country, many of the um, school districts with the similar uh, makeup of ours, they offer the PSAT for free so students can um, take that test and become aware of what they're doing and preparing for college. Our students don't take it because it's a $75 fee to go home. Then they're shocked the next year when they have to take the SAT. Um, so that's another thing I would want to um, make a change of in New York School District. Um, but basically, you know, number one thing is with the uh, understanding why students in New York are doing so well during the year and having trouble applying the standardized tests. And I think that that would have to be something we have to directly look at um, as a board. It really doesn't make sense that a student would go through the year in the 90s and need a remedial help based on standardized tests. Thank you, sir. I don't know. Because I think uh, some of the comments in the world we were making with my students and how Mr. King uh, touched on a lot of these points. I just would add that we need to have more hands on that when it comes to educating our children. And by that, I mean, I think we need to have more parental involvement and more um, community-based involvement. Um, because I think uh, we all know that parents are our first teachers. And the more we can engage parents in, in the educational process of the children, the better the outcome of the school will see for our children. So uh, in addition to the parents that have already been there, I think that is critical. Um, I, I especially also want to add that I think that this concept of ultimate education is also important because education or academic achievement doesn't necessarily mean you have to go to college. So there are other opportunities for other people. Some people are more inclined. Uh, a union electrician makes $45,000 an hour. That's a really good job. So, I mean, I, and you can get that with a high school diploma if, you, if you're attracted that way. So I think we need to really pursue various ways of attacking this issue of education, uh, education and academic achievement. Um, yes, uh, wow. I hate to be a grim leader here, but <laughs> if we feel the situation is bad now, I hate to inform everyone, but it's going to get worse because I don't know if people are aware the educational guidelines that are changing with regards to New York State, but there's something called the core, the uh, common core standard curriculum that's going to be used throughout the state, which is to ensure that every student in New York State learns the same thing. They're all on the same level. If we're behind now, if we continue doing what we're doing at the same pace and at the same rate, we're going to be a whole lot further behind. So we do need to address the low graduation rates, and we do need to address this district
getting ready for that shift in the core standard curriculum. One of the things that I would like to see took place, I had a conversation with an educator the other day, and she said to me, she said, you know, there's not a parent in the world who don't think their child is smart. And I said, what are you talking about? She said, you know, there's not a parent in the world who does not think their child is smart. But the reality is this, by third grade, we should be able to identify children who are truly smart. Because it's not about being able to think literally. At the fourth grade level, kids just start thinking critically. And those are the kids who are the intelligent children. But we as educators, we as parents, we as board members, we need to identify the children who aren't thinking critically at that age and get the help, get them the help that they need to become successful, to become smart, to be smart. Because every child really wants to succeed. We are that misconception that because the child is not studying hard, because he's not getting what we're teaching or how we're teaching, that they don't want to learn. That is the biggest misconception that we have in the school, in the school system, in the education period. All kids want to learn. It's up to us as parents, as educators, as community stakeholders to identify those children who aren't thinking critically at that third, fourth grade level and give them the help, give them mentorships, get them targeted to bring them up to speed. Because it's the end, the end by product of us not having our children graduate is far more dirt than educated children. We need to understand that it's cheaper to educate a child than to incarcerate a child. And when kids don't receive the proper education that they need, coming from our and large school district, Unfortunately, they resort to other ways to get by, which ultimately affects our community. It adds to the welfare rules, it adds to the homeless rates, it adds to crime. So we need to reach out to everybody in the community. We need to reach out to the stakeholders who have a vested interest in these kids succeeding and say, listen, what can we do to get our children better educated? Because you can't tell me, you can't sit here and tell me that we, don't, we can't get the resources here in the New York City School District that they had out on Long Island, or that they had up in Buffalo, or that they had out in Riverhead. They're there. We just need to find them. Thank you.
him and Peter said, she asked him, said, well, why do you even think the parents are involved? One reason why I don't feel involved, their educational needs wasn't met. So you have a single mother that's working, not one but two jobs, trying to stay afloat. So now that child, that young man, is running what? Running the streets. But she's out there, and then her report with the education system or her principal wasn't right. So what it does, it trickles down. They don't trust the school system. They feel that there's no advocacy there. So what I would like to do is also bring that back, make them feel more welcome. And we do, and they, they, this young lady, she worked very hard in the district. But we need our parents to get more involved in our children's education. Thank you. Everybody has to be successful 
completing the task that they're given in order for the ultimate goal, the end, the end product, to be successful. Now, the team here, where there's a disconnect, we have the students, parents, teachers, and the community. There has been a disconnect involved with that team. And see, when you put all four of those components together, you have a strong team. But if one does not do what they're supposed to do, then we have a disconnect, and we have a situation that we have going on right now in the New York City School District. Now, what I'm here to say is this. My solution is this. It's quite simple. It's old school. You bring the parents, you bring the teachers, you bring the school, you bring the parents, teachers, parents, teachers, students, and the community, stakeholders, bring them to the table. Hey, let's roll our sleeves up. You know, we're going to do this old school. You know what? We have a problem right now. No point in fame. Nobody's going to point fingers why we're where we're at. It's not your fault. I'm not saying the students aren't doing what they're supposed to do, the parents aren't doing what they're supposed to do. No, we're not going to do it that way. We're going to all take responsibility. Everybody has culpability in getting us to where we are right now. So now, we've identified the problem, now let's come up with a solution. We need to understand that in order for our children to get the quality education that they're all entitled to, we all must buy into this team effort. The students need to do what they're supposed to do, the parents are supposed to do what they're supposed to do, the teachers gotta have to do what they're supposed to do, we need to give them the resources to do what they're supposed to do, and the community is the last component of that collaboration. Because ultimately, if we all live in the same community, we all have a vested interest in our children receiving quality education. Because it allows them to become productive citizens in society. It allows them to become tax-paying citizens. It allows for everybody to have a win-win situation. So I feel that the biggest problem to go on right now is there's a disconnect in the team concept. And we need to all sit down together and admit that we have a problem. First of all, identify the problem, come up with solutions, and then you implement the change. That's what we need to do. It's a three-step process. It's not hard. It's nothing new. It's been done for years. But we need to do it here in New York. Thank you. sponsorships, people we can work with 
who would help us. And if we tell them our mission, what we're doing, and it's for a good cause, I don't see why we wouldn't be able to go out and get some um, grant money or uh, sponsorships to help, you know, go out and recruit some teachers and, and talk to the young teachers and come back to New York and other communities such as us and work and work with the kids. I mean, I think we're lacking that. Uh, excuses, or well, we don't have enough minorities certified. Let's get them certified. Um, and, 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 and just say, reach out to them, and I think we can do that over the next few years, and that'll be one of my goals for one board. Thank you. At this time, we're going to uh, take some questions from the audience. I hope that you've had some thoughts running in your heads. You can come, I can bring the mic to you, and you can ask your question of the board. The Board of Education has not put in place people and programs because that's what most of you have said. Uh, people and programs who understand what is needed for 21st century success. For example, Ms. Rush gave a litany of things that they did in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, uh, 2000. So those things are still going on. But this is the 21st century. So this being the 21st century, uh, and we're still working in the 20th century, for me, it doesn't work for my grandchild. Uh, I need for you to comment on this statement. If you didn't hear the statement, it is the present Board of Education has not put in place programs and people who understand 20, the 21st century needs of students. I need for you just to comment on that statement. I think I said, one of my comments that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. And I think maybe that's what we're stuck in. And so uh, my comment to your comment is that we need to be creative and innovative. Uh, we've talked a lot tonight about the issues that we feel affect the school district. I think we need to come together to, to identify the problem and then work to solve that problem. And we can't keep doing the same thing over and over. And we have to use methods and, and technology and, uh, and, and funding sources and being creative about um, grant writing, um, using community-based organizations, using faith-based institutions, using those things that are already in place. We do not have to reinvent the wheel, but we certainly have to make the wheel go. And so, to your comment about the 21st century, I do think that we do need to, you know, get into it and utilize it and take advantage of it. What's, what other school districts and other communities have so vastly taken advantage of and have achieved success. So um, I also say in my comment that we need to identify best practices where similar school districts are struggling with the same things that we are. What did they do to get around the issue of youth violence? What did they do to get around the issues of uh, uh, high, high dropout rate and low graduation rates? How did they solve their problems of dealing with um, alternate education? What, other, what kinds of resources did they avail themselves of? These are all ready, answerable things uh, that we can get answers to and that we can provide solutions to our community. So that's how we uh, deal with your problem. Um, to deal with your comment, Mrs. Bowles, to uh, keep it very short. Uh, being a former board member, you know, you know, you have to look out of the box. But as I said, it is frustrating. It's been very frustrating for two and three quarters of uh, years to have an idea and only be one vote. Keenan said, Ms. Bold, I believe our hiring practices have to change. I think that's, it starts there, you know. I think we, our district is known for nepotism. We hire our friends instead of the best person for the job. I think that really has to change. Um, really to help our kids go to the next 21st century because we, we need people to think out of the box. We need people really to really that's willing to do above and beyond for our kids. Thank you. I don't think
think the uh, school board is giving this community a fair shot in some of their plans and ideas. Uh, like not hiring an NBA basketball player to be the coach. You know. That that would have opened up doors for other things in the community for us. You know, I would like to see the school board work with the community. And it seems like the present school board is working against the community. And I would like for you to let me know what would you do to change that. If, if successful and become a member of the school board, uh, is, uh, one of the things that I'm very strong about is transparency and also parental involvement. As I said before, part of that chain is parental involvement. And we need to reach out to the community to find out what the pulse of the community is. Because, but there's a flip side of that, because a lot of times you'll hear people talk about some of the issues and the problems going on in the school district, but they never attend board meetings. They never win the schools to be. One thing a mentor of mine told me when, years ago that it sounded sound so simple, but at the time he said it, I didn't understand what, what he meant. He's like, let me tell you something, Bill. Be where you're supposed to be. Oh, okay. But what that really means is you need to be places that you need to be. You parents need to be at the board meetings. Parents need to know what's on the agenda at board meetings before they're acting upon. We need to be more proactive instead of reactive as a community. And as, 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 as community stakeholders, we need to put people's foot to the fire. If the board is not serving you, the next time the election come around, you serve them, you show them what the power of the ballot is. Because ultimately, we serve you. Not me, I'm not there yet. But the school board serves you. Something someone told us, something I like to say. You know, you're elected to serve these people for a period of time. But never forget that you are of the people. So you need to keep their hearts and their words and their minds also. So if the parents and the community do what they're supposed to do, then you force the board to do what you feel should be done because we serve you. Thank you. One Hispanic kid. We have to realize that when the student fails, he 
did not fail by himself. It's the board failed.
graduated from now. One of the things that I would hear about, I absolutely would hear about this other thing. One of the questions that I had, part of the hiring thing, and when the efforts were out there, people were going out to, to recruit the black you know, teachers, science teachers, the STEM program, and everything else. Retention is a problem. Part of the reason that I leave the school is because I was the last one hired, like many other ones. So the last one hired based on contract means first of all five as well. It's very difficult to get around with some kind of negotiations. But as far as recruiting goes, there are three African Americans currently who have their doctorates, including from Columbia University on curriculum instruction, who as a professional with a master's, a 60 credit master's, which means something as far as social work goes. It's very difficult to plan your life when you have a wife and family and such. But you feel as though there's no upward mobility other than the time slotted and that the credentials that you were fought for because it's all about. If we're not validating the profession, we're going to go receive their doctors who are sitting in assistant principal positions, even though know, having master principalships and superintendency, that does something to the professional life of being silent because that means that we are less than. And then, when social work is looked at as philanthropy rather than that's also something that's very difficult to pass on to the other people there. So my question is, when our students, because as a, as a social worker, we're speaking in power, and we're speaking in twitch, which means basically if a child identifies with you and wants to be like you, that hopelessness we're speaking about, when that child sees that the professionals who have the doctors, which is the highest level of the are not being validated, then how do we begin to let validation and that hope within the child having aspired to become something, what do we do with transparency to put something in place and let them learn that once they achieve this, that ceiling is not going to be glass anymore. How are we going to remove the cement ceiling that's going to be put in place of black family in the group of school district? And people like my sister. 
It's just absolutely unfair. Uh, to address that question, uh, it, it almost full circle. It almost full circle because a famous fraternity brother of mine once said, "If you find out how much a group of people will quietly submit to, then you'll know how much injustice can be put upon them." And I say that to say this. Ultimately, those teachers with those advanced degrees, the community should want to have those type of individuals teaching our children as administrators in our school district. So, come back around again. If the board is not putting the proper people in this, no, I do believe, I, I stand to be correct, but I do believe central administration is responsible for for the administration, people getting in uh, those positions. So if they're not giving you what you want, and if they've been doing it for years, what makes you think they're going to stop not giving you what you want or what you should have if you don't make the noise? It's up to the parents. If the school, because the school board is responsible, one of the duties of the school board is hiring superintendent and the successful office staff. If you feel that you're not getting what you feel you should be getting down there, then the people that are making those that, that, that are responsible for those decisions, they got to go. You need to put people in there who have concerns, have your who share your concerns. I mean, it's unfortunate, but if those people with all the necessary which sounds ridiculous to me, and they're not being considered for those top positions, there's an issue going on more deeply than what is being than what's being addressed. So my thing is to the community. The community needs to make noise. And you make noise in the ballot box. In the ballot with your ballot makes noise. If people aren't serving you, if you're not on this board serving the decisions, then you don't need to be there. Thank you. I think we need a break. 
bring that down a little bit. <laughs> The uh, all children not being on on course for college. One thing that we need to identify as a school district, and, and, and I'm, I'm very passionate about this, is I agree with you 100. All kids are not on college. That's just a plain fact. And we need to identify that early. We need as a school district, we need to embrace trade school. We need to embrace boasting. We need to embrace other forms of alternative education for our kids. Because what ends up happening when we find children that are not into the uh, the uh, the mainstream in regards to achieving a high school diploma, readers and all the other things that's involved, they usually get pushed to the wayside, and that shouldn't be. Because the, the truth of the matter is, there are children out here today that are brilliant with the right side of their brain. I mean, they're just hands on, and that that that's a heck of a lifestyle. Earning money, being able to be a carpenter, a plumber, electrician, a firefighter, I mean, stuff like that pays well. So we need to reach out to the community with regards to uh, trade school, trade training. We got level 17 here in Newburgh. We got uh, a, a lot of the electrical, we got the electrical units, we have both you know, We need to reach out as a district and try to come up with a collaborative effort to target children who aren't necessarily going to be a uh, Conserve the uh, normal way to receive a high school diploma and still allow them to graduate and have, have a trade school degree. Go, you know, go right into uh, to an apprenticeship or Global 17 or one of the locals around here. But we have to be more creative. We, can't, we have to stop doing things the same way. We have to reach out. We have to think outside the box and try to make coll uh, collaborations with some of the trade schools and folks and stuff of that nature. Thank you. Um, you talked about uh, children having trouble for honor students. Yeah, I mentioned that earlier with my own daughter. Um, you know, I think the problem goes is that we have all these tests and we have people evaluating them in central offices, but they don't really relay what the test means to the parents. Um, and, you know, we get test scores, you see them, sometimes you see what a national average is, but we really don't understand as parents. Um, we can only reach out most of the kids who want to be helped. I think we need to make sure there's after school programs, um, you know, they have funding for it, some free fund one program, other things. We just need to make sure qualified teachers are there working with these students, the ones that want to be helped to get to college. Um, and doing the same thing the colleges do, um, the English programs are learning how to write an essay. Um, the math, sitting there helping them get to the math. We need to make sure the teachers are doing that in high school, preparing for college. Um, you know, um, You mentioned class sizes. Um, I would need to know a little bit more about class sizes, um, the difference. Um, you know, one of my concerns with class sizes, uh, my daughter's in a Spanish class, and she said that there were 23 students in the class, and 12 of them were in a program called SAC. And I didn't understand it. And I said, well, have you ever been in SAC? And she said, no. I said, well, who's been in SAC that you know? She said, well, today is the girl that comes, I'm sorry to mention that, but um, the girl that comes to our house every day. I was like, but her parents have never said anything about it. You know, they sent a child to a program where they're not being properly educated. They're going down to a room where they're given their assignment. But the teacher that we expect to be teaching our child is not in that room teaching our child. And they're not calling the parent. So there's a concern about it. If my daughter was in that room for a whole day, missing all her classes, but she's given her assignments, but she's not being taught by the teacher. You know, um, you know, there's, there's, you know, a lack of teaching going on in certain classes. Um, you know, you know, from knowledge, uh, when you have a child that comes home and tells you that, all we did again was watch a video. You can't teach a class watching a video every day for the whole year. Um, you know, there, there's a lot that can be done, but I think the whole thing is we have to make sure we start with educating kids who want to be educated, and then try to pull them kids along. I want to finish your question about uh, budget. Um, I think what happens is uh, when we make decisions, we make decisions based on our worldview, our paradigm, how we see things, and we have to have a paradigm shift. Because what we have to do is we have to match our worldview with our values. And our values have to be, and our principles have to be when it comes to budget, is that we should 
not be doing anything that's going to hurt the educational outcome of our children. So if that's a principle, if that's a value that we have, that has to be the way we manage our brain. Secondly, I think if uh, we're looking at how we manage our budget, we also need to be creative in how we increase the amount of funds that are included in that budget. We can't always be operating from a deficit modality because when you operate from deficit modality, you operate in defeat and you operate just trying to get by. And if you continue to always try to get by, you never get great results. And then the final thing is, I think we have to have equity and fairness and transparency. When you talk about how you deal with a budget, everybody needs to know everything about what the process is, that we need to be fair and equitable in how we distribute and, and, and cut away funding from our budget. We should not be bothered, we should not just be reaching out to lower income food, things that we think we can cut and we can get away with. We should be looking at the system wide. If there's going to be cuts that have to be made, it should be proportionate, it should be fair, it should be equitable, it should be system wide, it should also mirror those principles and values that I talked about. We should not be cutting if it's going to hurt the uh, academic outcome of our children, and we should not be cutting uh, things that are going to affect our students in a way that's not going to be positive. So that's how I would like to deal with the budget question. Transparency, fairness, equity, and with an eye toward making sure that we don't do anything to hurt the educational outcomes for our children. Thank you. This will be the last question we have. Actually, I have a question for you guys. Basically, there's been a great level of um, bullying that's been happening in our school system. Um, it's something like, what are you going to do about the high levels of bullying? Because you can't even walk out of his own his or her own house without wondering is she gonna is he or she gonna come home that day. We have students that have potential to learn, but if the environment is not safe enough, they're not gonna come to school. So my question for that is what are you gonna do about bullying and school violence? That's, that's a great question. And I'm gonna I'm gonna address that. You be a student right now in that Bible game that you have a question such as that. Um, we're dealing with from, from the outside of you're in there, you're in the trenches, and you're saying that. So, as I said earlier, in regards to dignity for all students act, then you need to make sure that it's being enforced. So obviously, what you're telling me, because it was said on the stage earlier that it is being enforced. So but if you come to me with this issue, as passionate as you're speaking, I'm, I'm gonna tell you. I will address that. That needs to be addressed. Our children need to feel safe going to that school. If there's a dignity for all children that that should be in place and is not doing what it's supposed to do, then we need to address it. And you students need to speak up with regards to that. Not be scared of it. Because if you're scared to go to school, if a kid's scared to go to school, then we got a problem. There's a problem that needs to be addressed. So if elected, I will ensure that that dignity for all students act will be addressed. I also have um, one more issue is the school address code, basically the small school district, mainly um, middle school and high school, is not being exactly addressed because we still have um, kids that are dressed a lot older than what they're supposed to be dressing. My, my view is um, if you have an interest in school uniform, You know, I went to school, graduated from NFA in 1991. Um, you know, we had a principal at that time that had dress code when you were at home, you weren't dressed appropriate. Um, your shorts had to be a certain length, your pants had to be up. I think if they just go back to enforcing those rules, it um, would be a good start. Um, you know, I'm not so much for uniforms, but if, you know, parents and community voted on it, and the majority of the people wanted to go there, I wouldn't have a problem. But, um, you know, um, getting back to quickly your bullying thing, um, I think we need to be educated on what bullying really is. Um, you know, first of all, we gotta educate the teachers, um, the students, and the parents. Um, you know, my daughter recently went through something with her best friend, and my wife called it bullying. I called it misunderstanding. Um, and, and I think you just really need to 
address each situation individually. But the education is the biggest part. Teachers understanding what it is, and also letting the students know what it is and the punishment that they will receive if they do those things.